Thank you, Dayan. Um, welcome, everyone. We'll wait a few minutes that you can comfortably sit and uh, present each other. Uh, but uh, you're uh, basically, we are coming to an end of the really successful summit, business summit, and also the summit of the presidents. But as yesterday the Polish president said, the success of this summit will be not measured with uh, statements and uh, initiatives and uh, meetings, but rather with kilometers of the roads and new terminals. So this will be an interesting discussion. What are we aiming for right now? Yes, this will be one of the questions for our distinguished panelists and also for a uh, very nice uh, surprise at the beginning. And this will all be our uh, key points uh, that we'll be asking our guests over here. Investment, uh, digitalization, uh, 3SI fund, and uh, also all the security challenges that it presents. So this will be all our key, key points. And um, I suggest that because we're a little bit uh, short on time that we start we with start. our- We start. So I kindly invite all of you that will be with us to comfortably sit down and we'll have a really interesting uh, starting debate or rather say presentation by a very special Slovene who works and lives in the United States of America. Jure Leskovic is assistant professor at the Stanford University. He also successfully sold his company to Pinterest and by that he also became a chief scientist officer. And um, he will talk about the future which is happening now. So we will not only talk about roads, railways, but also about artificial intelligence, about data, and all the things that also should be considered when we are talking about the region, when we are talking about investment, and when we are talking about the future of three seas countries. So with that, no further ado, I would really like to invite our special guest, Jure Leskovets, to present our, his presentation. Thank you, Jure. Uh, great. So, um, thank you for the invitation, and um, I'm really excited to talk to you about and give you some perspectives on um, transformation driven by the artificial intelligence. Right? There is a lot of talk about what is AI and what AI is not. So, uh, I give you the definition of AI that was agreed by 41 countries uh, that are members of the OECD uh, community. Essentially, AI is a set of machine-based systems that are capable of influencing the environment and making predictions, decisions, or recommendations. Right? So we, we think of these as autonomous systems making decisions or helping us make decisions. And essentially, there are three components to these autonomous systems. Their ability to sense the environment and collect the data from the environment, their ability to analyze this data, comprehend it, and add meaning and insights to it, and then based on this um, data analysis, actually act in the environment. So basically take an action and make a step um, uh, to, to do the next action. And what is new or what is the essential catalyst of these AI solutions is their ability to autonomously learn, adapt, and improve. Right? So the common theme is to improve the performance based on the real world experience. And as these systems are deployed, they will, they will get better over time. So why can we do this today, and what is different than it was in, uh, uh, in previous years? So there are three important parts that are different today. So the first part is, that, is the digital transformation, which basically means that today we can collect large amounts of data from various aspects of human life. Anything from satellite imagery, the digital traces that we as users, citizens, humans, are living by uh, using digital services, online social media and social networks, a lot of infrastructure, transportation, uh, environment, power grid is today being sensed by gazillions of sensors that are deployed um, in the environment. And then of course, big scientific instruments, uh, experiments that we are running are, are collecting massive amounts of data. So what this really means is that for the first time, uh, computers are processing data. And in the past, the biggest computers we had were actually used to generate data, to run physics-based simulations and so on. So 
The second advancement is that we made big steps forward in terms of machine learning, artificial intelligence, and statistics, where these deep neural networks that can take in complex inputs to provide complex outputs are now able uh, to be engineered and trained. And when I say trained, I really mean that we need the underlying computing infrastructure that allows us to do this, right? And in the last five, 10 years, there's been huge advancements made in terms of developing systems as well as computing architectures that allow us to compute over this massive data as efficiently as possible. And all these three, the culmination of data, tools, and uh, hardware, the compute power, allow us to, do, to be in this renaissance of AI. So, how does this magic work? How could we go and explain what is really happening under, underneath these systems? So the paradigm is that we want to learn from massive amounts of data. And the way this learning is done, it's done based on examples, right? So the idea is that we are given many examples, and then the system will learn how to map the input to the output. So the simplest example would be that maybe you want to distinguish or recognize cherries from apples. So what your training examples will be is a set of um, pairs where, you know, on the left is an image of a cherry and on the right is a label, whether it's a cherry or an apple. And then in between, we will have this AI system that will take the image as the input and then through a series of complex mathematical operations, this neural network with different connection strands, it will output a prediction whether something is a cherry or an apple. And the idea is that this neural network that will, on the input, take parts of the image, transform it, and then light up the top blue node whether the thing is a cherry and the bottom node whether the thing is the apple. Basically, th this will happen through this uh, neural network of connections where these connections can have different strengths. And the whole goal is to set billions of these connections in a proper way to send their strengths such that these types of predictions are possible. So what this means is that the way we train the system is that we show them a lot of these cherry apple type pairs, and then every time a system makes a mistake, we would slightly readjust millions of these weights try and try to make it make good predictions. So what are the consequences of this, the way we are building these systems and the way we are training them? So the consequence is that first, we need large amounts of data. We need a lot of these examples of image and label, right? What is the what image of a cherry and the label that it's a cherry? Another important thing is that because we train these systems using historic data, it means that the data needs to be of high quality. And this also means that all the historic biases that are uh, kind of captured in the data will be captured by the systems we build as well. And that's very important realization. The other thing is that, as I will show next, is building these systems is non-trivial. It requires a critical mass of knowledge as well as tools and infrastructure. And then the, the last important point I want to make is that when we build these systems, we cannot build them in the isolation. What I mean is that they are not this magic silver bullet we just deploy and automatically it will work. But it's really the way to build them is that we cannot do it in an isolated way from the complex, let's say, social ecosystem that it serves. So issues like fairness, transparency, explainability, bias, are uh, at the core of building si these systems. So all the stakeholders need to work together in order to provide proper solutions uh, where AI can be deployed. So let me tell you a few areas where I think AI is going to make a big disruption. So the first area I would call is intelligent automation, where basically the AI is going to far enhance traditional automation solutions. Right? And this will allow us to automate complex tasks that require adaptability and agility. Right? And especially, this will be very powerful combined with the ability to self-learn and improve. Examples of these things would be anything from self-driving cars, self-flying planes, uh, but also automation in business processes um, where a lot of mundane tasks today done by humans will be able to be automated. The second big area is this ability of these types of systems to provide us with enhanced judgment, right? Where we can augment human decision making to make it more consistent, more transparent, more fair, and more efficient. And this will allow basically humans to focus on parts where they provide the most value and let machines do the mundane parts. Examples of this range from anything from medical diagnostics where you can think about reading radiology images 
to uh, applications in, in public policy, uh, credit scoring, uh, f um, as well as in a judicial system, where these types of systems could serve as helpers to the judges make better and fairer decisions. Because we all know that we as humans are, are very biased in all kinds of different ways, and machines could help here. The third big area is the area of intelligent products and interactions, right? Essentially, what this means is that by, by the ability of us sense what the human, the customer, the employee is doing, this will allow us to provide superior experience to customers based on the personalization and curation of, let's say, real-time information. So essentially, everything that's happening on the web and in the online ecosystem uh, is already is already doing this where we where everything is super personalized to the user themselves uh, but the same things are now moving to the offline world where personalized products recommendations um, are being used and then the fourth big area where I think a lot of, there is a lot of opportunity is actually to enhance trust what I mean by this is that these systems can be de deployed to fraud detection uh, enhancing financial controls and also better manage risk and this means that this can be used both in the financial banking sector, um, but also to basically en enable better um, governance and transpar transparency. So I think policymakers, governments, could use these types of tools to the advantage of the citizens and, uh, that they serve. But what is very important to realize is that building these types of systems is amazingly hard, especially if we want to build them the right way. So let me show you some examples and some of some challenges that present AI systems are facing. First is this issue of bias and fairness, right? If you remember how I explained you how these systems are being trained by examples, is that basically the, the systems are based on using data uh, and past examples, past experiences. This means that past biases and discrimination gets reinforced. And what is maybe even more important is that, that once these systems are being deployed and they are making decisions, they are actually affecting what kind of data are we collecting about the world, so which may even further um, enhance and kind of self-reinforce uh, the biases in the, in the data or that uh, are already present today. The second important thing is that these systems are inherently going to make mistakes and they need to be debuggable and we need to be able to look into them and make sure that we can fix those mistakes. Today's AI systems are actually amazingly complex and many, hard, many times it's amazingly hard to explain why does a mistake like this that should never happen, uh, why does a system do it? Another important thing is that these systems will need to be amazingly robust. And today's AI systems are actually far from robust. What I'm trying to show you here is an image of the panda on the left that every human would say, yes, this is a panda. And the machine says, it's a panda with, you know, 57% probability. But then if you, if you are very careful how you add a bit of noise to this image, noise depicted by the middle image, and you add the two images together, you get the image on the right that to every human still looks like a panda, but actually a uh, an AI system will now think this is a, this is a monkey. And you can imagine lots of cases where for normal looking examples, machines are doing well, but when an, when an adversary comes, it can actually play and trick the machine, the AI system, into making big mistakes, like I try to illustrate here. So let me conclude with a few uh, high level points, consequences, and conclusions. So I think the first important thing is that we need to realize that AI, these AI systems are not just the technology problem and they are not kind of developed and deployed in, in isolation. It is important that we put the human in the center and that we make sure that whatever is deployed is compatible with the humans, with the employees, customers, their values and expectations. It is important that these, these systems are uh, checkable and verifiable, that they comply with ethical AI design and, es and are especially transparent. It is important for us to be able to look into them and verify them. And then, of course, they need to, they need to be compliant. They need to be able to evolve together with government regulations as well as the public uh, sentiment. It is important to realize that these systems are going to bring big changes to our work um, jobs and workforce, right? What will happen is that the, 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 it will expand the scope of different jobs into higher complexity and more rewarding activities. Um, AI systems will allow us to make skills more transferable as en entries barriers will be lower. And of course, new positions will also be created and new roles in jobs will be needed. 
So to build on that, I think training and education are the key uh, to be able to face with this um, transformation that AI is bringing to us. Because in order to build these systems, to manage them, new jobs and new skills will be required. Right? There is, of course, a set of AI-specific skills in terms of um, computer science, statistics, mathematics, uh, engineering, and related areas. Of course, also um, human-centered design is a very important part here. Then new positions will be, new job roles, new positions will be opened in terms of roles to manage, protect, and infuse ethics in the AI solutions. And what I, may also happen is that um, there might be actually very diverse skill sets needed, and there might be like a renaissance for certain professions that were traditionally not well connected to the technology, but in this AI world will become uh, very relevant. Another important thing I think that we need to realize is from the point of policy making is that these AI systems are not monolithic, that they include a diverse set of technologies with different properties, strengths, and weaknesses. And policy makers should address these, these solutions um, as such. Another thing that is important is I think it's uh, better to talk about um, um, uh, policy making at the level of automate, automated decision making or autonomous systems and not worry about the uh, particular intricacies of particular implementations of alg algorithms um, and so on. And to conclude, to address the, the AI challenge, I think we have to address it in the context-specific manner. Policy should target, should be, should target per specific demands in specific contexts, and uh, one-size-fits-all checklists, I think, should be avoided. Another thing that is important is I think we have to be very proactive. And I, here I see especially Europe to be very risk averse. And by our risk aversion, we are in some sense implicitly banning AI and letting other nations, other cultures around the world to, to develop these technologies, which we at some point in time, whether we like it or not, will be forced to adopt. So I think it's better to promote this development of these tools here um, internally uh, for our greater benefit. So what I think to conclude is, I think we should really seize the, oppor the opportunity and exploit the attention as well as, as the industry, as policymakers, as governments that is devoted uh, to AI right now. So um, with this, I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jure. It's always so nice to listen to Professor Liskovitz. Many complex things seem so easy with him. But we'll see what we can talk now. Yeah, after artificial intelligence, I hope for some human intelligence, and I'm pretty sure that our next panelists will be the ones that will answer really, really complex questions. So we will talk about the keywords that we mentioned before, and without further ado, we have uh, to ask our distinguished guests up to the podium. So we'll start with um, our Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Miro Cerar. Professor no. of Law and former Prime Minister of Republic of Slovenia. Mr. Jacek Zaputovic, please help me with your uh, second name. Hope I didn't pronounce it uh, wrongly. That's, that's okay. That's a good pronunciation. <laughs> okay, thank you and welcome. And then <laughs> Marine General James L. Jones. Former, here you are, former head of Atlantic Council and Marine Commandant, and also former National Security Advisor at the um, administration of Barack Obama. Welcome. And uh, Dr. Yerne Piccolo, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Education, Science and Sports in Slovenia. So thank you all for coming and uh, of course at the end when we were listening for two days for really interesting discussions but also listening to many prominent uh, ideas what should be done in this part of Europe. Uh, my initial question uh, will go to you uh, Minister Zerar. Um, we are the host uh, of this year TRISIS initiative and uh, when we look at the results uh, as said before it's really important what will happen next because uh, the ideas are there, uh, the willingness to collaborate is there. But what do you think is the most important uh, 
to happen next. Well, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, panel. Uh, and thank you all to be here in Ljubljana, participating uh, in this event. So in my, op in my opinion, now we must deliver. Uh, we have uh, had a lot of ideas, projects so far, developed many of them. But now, as we all know, uh, we have to come with some very concrete results. And uh, it will uh, be much more persuasive for the public, for the people uh, who need to recognize the added value of these projects if we do certain very concrete, tangible things uh, which will connect us better, uh, which will uh, provide for better connectivity in terms of uh, roads, uh, rails, uh, digi digital, digital connectivity, etc. I believe that this is the, our main task now. But of course, uh, we also need to understand that this uh, initiative, Three Seas Initiative, uh, comprises uh, the EU countries. The 12 countries uh, being part of it are all members of the European Union. And uh, in this way, this is also the EU project, as far as I see it. So it must be complementary, complementary to the uh, European Union, its efforts to provide for uh, let's say, another push now, because we all, we all understand that the European Union as a whole needs a new environment for new progress. Uh, now we are all, f we have been faced now with uh, the elections, uh, Brexit and all other things, all kinds of crises. So we need to do more on develop development now. And I think that this uh, initiative is kind of a push the Europe needs. And uh, I would like to stress again, it must be understood as being fully competitive, uh, compa uh, comp uh, complementary, sorry, <laughs> with the European Union uh, activities. And this is why I'm very glad that uh, also uh, German president uh, attended uh, and that uh, we are trying to be very transparent, very open when discussing our projects. So this would be basically for the beginning. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kabudovic, uh, your president said yesterday, and we mentioned this before earlier on the stage, um, the success of the three CI will not be measured by declara declarations, by meetings, but uh, rather by kilometers of railways, of roads. Um, what is the action plan? What's a key takeaway from Ljubljana? So this is a third meeting, third year, and I think that institutionalization is going on. So the fund was created. I think now we have to simply turn that discussions into concrete projects. But I would like to underline the basis of our um, organizations or initiative, as we call it. These are 12 member states of the European Union, but indeed, there is a glue among us. This glue is common interest. I think that our countries, maybe with one exception of Austria, uh, found themselves after the Second War, uh, World War on the wrong side of the um, uh, Iron Curtain. So we have common, we share common history, which introduced also our possibility to develop. We are less developed than the Western countries. Now we are within the European Union but we have common interest within the European Union, which is, for example, to have a very ambitious uh, budget. We are for strong European Union. We are for maintaining this traditional policies, and particularly common agricultural policy and also cohesion policy. On the 1st of May, there was a meeting in Warsaw of 13 countries which joined the European Union 15 years ago and later. When I realized that here, when I look at the countries in, in, uh, invited to that meeting, taking part in this initiative, so all of them were, except for um, Austria, they were present there, uh, and plus two countries which do not belong to this initiative, Malta and Cyprus, which joined uh, 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 European Union at that time. 
And we issued in Warsaw a declaration showing our vision of the European Union, which is strong European Union, competitive one with maintaining um, a sound economic basis for development, a strong uh, single market with four freedoms, including freedom of movement of uh, workers and uh, services. Uh, the threat to the European Union is protectionism, and this is in the interest of our countries to defend that vision of Europe. We are also, we discussed yesterday also, um, for European enlargement, uh, we cooperate with Slovenia and other countries to, 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 to convince the European Union that they should be open to Western Balkan countries. We are for strong uh, um, uh, bonds with um, our Eastern partners, Ukraine for example, it was also mentioned. So this is a group of countries which share common vision of the European Union and we realize that when we uh, read this Warsaw Declaration with this underlying principle. So there are good bases, interests are good bases for cooperation. Now being within the European Union, and I agree particularly yesterday, um, Estonian president raised that point that there is a European Union responsible for the development. We as a country cannot take responsibility for, for, for improving relations with Eastern partners, for example, and we should profit from being with the, the European Union. Of course, what was many times said uh, at uh, the, the meeting that infrastructure, we have to invest in infrastructure in uh, interconnectivity. There is also a good uh, instrument for maintaining close relations with the United States, and I am very glad that uh, the representatives of the United States take part in the discussions and general taking part in this panel. Because for us, due to our location, transatlantic links are crucial. We want Americans to be in Central Europe in order simply to defend us from the threat which is uh, uh, in the East. So we share also threat perceptions. Uh, when particularly, maybe not so much Slovenia, but Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Romania. So for us, NATO, transatlantic things are crucial. And I am very glad that there is a support and interest from the United States to be present in Central uh, and Eastern Europe. Thank you very much. General, uh, we, we heard uh, our transatlantic uh, relations are really important, as Minister Caputo has said. And for us, it's pretty clear what we want from this, addressing imbalances between East and West for us uh, three seas countries. But why is it so important for the U.S. to have this continued and supportive role of this initiative? Well, like many of you, uh, this morning I woke up and turned on the television and watched the um, ceremonies unfolding at Normandy. And um, my reaction was um, that this uh, it was ac absolutely a wonderful event, well organized, well deserving. And but I was reminded by the fact that being here in Slovenia and as part of the region, that the the end of World War II, or the beginning of the end of World War II, actually ushered in an era where um, a lot of Europe um, was thrust into a period of the darkness of communism. Uh, so we defeated Nazism, but communism took a little while, and for almost, for the better part of half a century, the liberation of Europe was not complete. In 2014, I was honored to co-chair a study um, with the Atlantic Council and a Mr. Pavel Oleknowicz uh, from Poland who was with the Central Europe Energy Partners. And we published the document that was rolled out in Istanbul at an energy conference, and it was called Completing Europe, uh, the North-South Corridor. That name has been replaced by the, by the a, a better title called a Three Seas Initiative. But two countries immediately stepped forward and, uh, and endorsed the, uh, the concept, and that was Poland and, and Croatia, at least uh, conceptually. And since then, there have been annual meetings that give form and substance to the Three Cs initiative. But it's important to remember the strategic concept, context that still underpins the Three Cs initiative. And the Three Cs initiative, in concept, is a response to the Russian decision to turn its back on the Euro-Atlantic community, promoting its anti-NATO doctrine and blaming the United States for the dissolution of the Soviet Union, 
um, NATO expansion into the former Warsaw Pact nations, and um, essentially believing that everything bad that happened to the former Soviet Union uh, was, um, was perpetrated by the United States and its friends and, and allies. This doctrine continues today as evidenced by the annexation of the Crimea, the destabilization of Ukraine, and consistent efforts to fragment the Euro-American relationships in any way possible. But the three C's is also about recognizing that there is a need to talk about new borders that define the defense of Europe, the Baltics uh, and the Black Sea. And within that zone, specific emphasis on the three C's region. Five years later, 3SI is about energy, transportation, telecommunications, and the relevance of the transatlantic partnership to your question for the rest of the century and beyond. And I'm firmly convinced as a former NATO commander um, that the path to the future is through collective security, which is assured by NATO, which the United States is proud to be a, a part of, good governments and rule of law, which many countries are, are working on and making great progress, but also economic development that brings parity in, in the European landmass. We live, ladies and gentlemen, in an era that for the moment is known as the return of autocrats, smart autocrats who know how to use the speed of decision making in their systems. They know how to use the variety of tools ranging from social media to the cyber domain to economic coercion and a brand new set of diplomatic engagement without really effective consequences in response. And as an aside, I would suggest to you that we might be witnessing a return to a bipolar world, but this time instead of US and Russia, it would be US and China. But 3C's initiative is a great response, potentially, albeit a slow one. Thus far from the US perspective, well articulated by our 3C's ambassadors and yesterday by Secretary Perry, the three C's concept is received enthusiastically, but it has a guarded quality to it at the same time. Enthusiastic, because it is a great strategic initiative that will benefit the region, the Europe, Europe in general, and the new transatlantic partnership, which has served us all so well for so long. The three C's member nations, though, uh, it, evidence suggests that the three C's member nations have not yet bought into what it takes to make it work. To be more specific, regarding the American view of 3C's initiative, I would offer the following brief comments. The United States is encouraged by the strategic agreement that this is important to do. The United States is puzzled in the lack of structural architecture that is required to achieve success. The 16 plus one forum seems to be better organized and better publicized than the 3C's. And specifically, the structure of 3Cs and its economic underpinning has been lacking. From the US perspective, there is no single point of engagement for either public or private sectors to access. No phone number, no email, no staff, no website. I completely understand the resistance to building a bureaucracy for 3Cs initiative, but there is a need for some sort of steering group that can respond to the inquir inquiries about how public and private sector goals can be achieved, especially with regard to transatlantic engagement. The U US Chamber of Commerce, for example, would love to be a part of this uh, group of chambers of commerce, but they don't really know how to do it. So it doesn't require a lot of money, not a big organization, certainly not a big bureaucracy, but it requires us giving some, some thought to it. The digital pillar of 3SI, as the professor just mentioned, especially as it relates to 5G, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, this is the pillar that will, if done correctly, will have the most transformative effect on the European continent and will sustain the transatlantic relationship for the balance of the century. So 3SI is strategically very important and very supported by the US government. It has economic potential that is transformative not just for the region, but for Europe in the partnership. The US has $60 billion sitting uh, ready to invest in development projects like the three C's. 
but it wants to see 3C's members buy in as well. And to that point, 3C's leadership is critical. As Secretary Perry said yesterday, let's use the year before us to achieve actionable objectives. We can do this, and we should do this. Thank you. Thank you, General Jones. If I may just um, <laughs> comment on this. Just today, 11 MCHAMs, European MCHAMs, which are also part of the US Chamber, or not part, but basically connected with, signed the um, joint statement to support it. So I guess there is a way how US Chamber could be more involved, but uh, the really important question remains, uh, do US really want to invest to Europe? Because uh, in some media, there was uh, many things said, like, is this a part of opening a new market, or is this a really a wish to invest? So maybe we will come back to that, but let's first give the floor to Minister Piccolo. Uh, we are discussing transport, energy, um, and we're discussing infrastructure, but of course we need to discuss people because uh, this region definitely this, um, is offering a great talent. And probably an important question is how to basically keep and uh, remain uh, talents here and uh, how then investors can come and really have a great investment in the region. Thank you so much for the uh, question and um, good morning. Or Good day to all of you. Um, you're right, this is one of the biggest challenges that we actually um, have. Every society that is there at the moment wants to be three things, and that is wants to be happy, wants to be healthy, and wants to be wise. Those are the three things that we all want, and those are the three things that we all wish for. And that's why uh, maintaining and nurturing talents is one of the biggest issues every government has. Because obviously, as the uh, technologies, but also societies get more complex, the more complex also education is. And that's why the investment into education is one of the most complex issues uh, there is. Plus, what we do with, uh, with education is we're always lagging behind on the developments that are already going on out there. Because education is always a long process. It takes 15, 20 years to educate uh, someone from, from, six years, uh, from six years on. By then, you see technology already changes. Uh, a lot of social skills that we have might change, and so on and on and on. So first to educate, but then to retain talent, and uh, obviously uh, to create conditions under which this talent can thrive in their working lives is really uh, one of the challenges that we're all facing, not just Slovenia, but I guess, uh, but I guess across, the, uh, but across the world. Here, I would like to mention something especially, uh, not just because Aisha is female, but you see gender balance, but not just gender balance. That's one of the most important things that we must do. We must have equal and both genders must have equal access, not just access, but also opportunities and everything else that goes with it. Because otherwise, we're simply forgetting one part of the population or having less chances for one part of the population. We're talking all kinds of, you know, all kinds of technologies, STEM, this and that, not just humanities and social sciences. Therefore, equal opportunities but also equal chances in terms of later, uh, uh, later professional life, so to speak. Thank you. So coming back to you, General Jones, um, basically the question that we started before is uh, also really the transatlantic matters, the common values that we have. That is important for the security, but it's also important for trade. And we can say that it should be really uh, a two-side uh, road and also investment should be the two-side road. And here, uh, discussing the region of three SI, three Cs, how do you think we could work better together? Well, I, um, I don't think there's any, any doubt about uh, the answer to that question. Uh, the United States feels very, very tied to, the, to, to the Europe and Europeans. We have common values, common history. We've been through a lot together. Um, 
As I mentioned in my, my opening comments, we believe that the defense of Europe starts at the Black Sea and in the Baltic states now, and there is, unfortunately, we are talking about the defense of Europe. Uh, you're faced with uh, um, a, 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 at least one country that uh, is trying to destabilize and fracture the relationship. Um, uh, what my comment about investment um, is, is the United States will invest in, in the three C's, besides giving it strategic support and everything else, because it's obviously a great transformative idea. But, you know, in, in the year since Bucharest, only two countries of the, of the three C's initiative have invested in the, in the fund. Um, what will propel the U.S. To, to invest, I think, either from the public sector or the private sector, is the evidence that everyone is in. Um, it doesn't mean everybody has to contribute the same amount, but everybody has to be invested. And then I think you'll see the, the, um, the private and the public sector uh, in the U.S. say, okay, this is serious. They're buying into it. We're going to help. And, and so it's a two-step process. But as far as the values that unite us, uh, as far as our sense of what the world is like um, today and what the, the new threats are to our collective uh, societies, these are very real threats and, and we should take them seriously and we should take them on one at a time together, not separate. United we stand, divided we fall. We cannot be divided and I think I speak for not only my military uh, colleagues, but my time uh, in the political spectrum as well. This is a very, very, probably the most important relationship that the United States has on, on the planet. Minister Serer, uh, we heard the general said that uh, US government has 60 billion uh, US dollars waiting to be invested, but on the other hand, and this is probably a question for both of you, and after that number we saw a uh, Polish uh, minister also nodding with that number. Uh, this is prob probably a question for both of you. Uh, obviously they see that there's no um, practical infrastructure, no number to call. How do we um, convince uh, other member states of 3CI to invest, and will Slovenia invest, and uh, how we don't make uh, too big of a bureaucracy out of it. <laughs> Thank you for the question. It's a tough one, <laughs> especially with the la in the That's last That's why part. we're here, yeah. Let me first say that um, high expectation on investments mobilized by uh, or from the EU cohesion policy, including connecting Europe facility, and in particular through, through Juncker Fund, not, proved not to be fully met. So we are still lacking about 75% of infrastructure that needs to be built in uh, the uh, three seas region by 2050. So this is a really big problem and uh, lacking that much of connectivity uh, tells a lot. That according to the latest report from the EU uh, Court of Audit, published in January this year, geographically, more, most investments were concentrated in a few larger EU member states with stronger economies and better established national promotional banks, which tells us something about, uh, I would say, double standards in Europe. And this is something we must uh, avoid and prevent and overcome in the future. And for this reason, I see uh, big benefits in this three C's initiative because it is very helpful to those countries who must develop uh, with more speed, which, uh, which needs uh, more impetus, uh, financial and other kinds of, of I would say, um, uh, impetus. So definitely we need more investments here from the EU from the, uh, our, our uh, friends uh, on the other side of the Atlantic, and I'm very much in favor of this transatlantic bond. That's, that's very important for the Europe as a whole. And uh, maybe this idea should be really seriously considered about creating some steering, I don't know, committee, some 
small uh, administrative force uh, which would uh, then communicate um, the needs and the possibilities uh, regarding the Three Seas Initiative because with no organization there will be uh, really no success. And I think this is maybe one of the next steps, but I'm very much uh, against uh, creating a very big uh, uh, bureaucracy here or uh, new bodies uh, just for their own sake. So I agree with that. And let me also say something, uh, if I can, very briefly, about uh, what really connects us, not just within the Three Seas Initiative, but also broader. First of all, of course, we are connected by interests, but interests change with time, with space, and this is not enough. And uh, very often they are uh, created by particular uh, nations and countries and they, co they never coincide fully. So we need very much common values. And uh, I bet on them, I really believe in the European common values. This is a very strong force that uh, brings us together and uh, actually enables uh, our future. But of course, many times we are very weak when we need to implement those values, when we need to show them in real life, when to need to, we need to uh, follow them. So um, there is the third element I see, which is very important. This is the rule of law because this is the cohesive force which binds us together and it is, uh, in my, op my opinion, one of the most important civilizational achievements, which brings also non-discrimination, equality, uh, human rights and everything. So I bet on this also and I do hope that um, the Three Seas Initiative will stay with this, within this framework, common values, rule of law and of course uh, all kinds of incentives and uh, organizational, I would say, actions to provide for concrete investments and for concrete uh, projects. So uh, that would be briefly what I wanted to add. Okay. Minister Kapucevic, uh, Poland is perceived as one of the countries who is uh, really in the lead of uh, having a common fund and uh, fund and uh, also when we were listening to investment discussion um, really promoting it um, how do you see it why do you believe in it and what do you think should be the next steps so as i already said the practical steps are uh, here uh, would be welcomed in order to change uh, the the formula of the initiative uh, and indeed to realize the goals uh, as General said, um, when uh, um, General Jones said about the kind of a institution, further institutionalization, secretariat or a steering group, I think it, 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 it's a good idea, but it reminds me a question. It was, as I well remember, Henry Kissinger who asked, what is the telephone uh, number to Europe? So I think that uh, the Americans repeat this question, what is the telephone number to three C's because they want to uh, cooperate closely but they don't know. Uh, President Donald Trump came to Warsaw last year, there was a meeting in Bucharest now in the lovely city of Ljubljana next year in other place. I think that th this practicality, it is, it is important and I'm very glad that uh, Minister Zera just also accepted the idea to maybe to create kind of a steering group and, and secretariat. I do not think that the found mentioned <coughs> by General Jones concerning development, it is right instrument. I think that the United States have to see the possibility to make profit, to, 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 to conduct business activity. A good example of that is LNG terminal in Poland in Świnoujście. We already contracted supply, good price, less expensive than from Russia through pipes, a long-term agreement. If we construct the, another one in Kirk and maybe on a, on a, in, in Croatia and in a uh, Black Sea, it would be kind of a network which will uh, lead to lowering the price. 
the market will be more competitive, or simply it will be a market, and we will be less dependent on supply from Russia. So we have to create business kind of um, opportunity to, 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 and that it will come. And I am uh, rather optimistic because uh, when you look at the companies making profit in our part of the region, there are huge profits transferred to the European Union. We often compare the situation on illustrate the, the, by, by, by situation of in Poland. We receive a lot of uh, from the European Union in terms of uh, st structural funds, but much more is transferred to Western companies from Poland because they make simply here a profit. And the United States is a very good partner because they have some feature we do not find in other Western European countries concerning their business. First of all, this energy aspect. Uh, the US is exporter of gas. Second, high level of technology. And third, this military dimension. So I think that, uh, that we have to uh, use that opportunity. It's not that the Western Europe does not have contacts with the United States or that we would like to change to, but we would like to be at least uh, uh, treated as an as a equal partner. So the main problem within the European Union is this double standards and different lights of countries. Uh, when Minister uh, Serra referred to rule of law, I thought uh, probably he thinks about Poland because, because Poland is criticized by, by the rule of law. But I would like to draw your attention to one, one ruling of the, of the uh, European Court of Justice just as just recently, we won the case, a, a case against Commission, which uh, forbidden us uh, uh, the, to introduce taxes of, uh, of, on, on supermarkets. So it is not that Commission always is right. Uh, there are some cases like this one which shows that until the case is not decided by the proper body established in the treaty, uh, European Court of Justice or the Council of Europe, you cannot say uh, that there is um, a threat to the rule of law because if it is the case indeed, then it would be much more difficult for uh, to attract capital because capital, Western capital, American uh, companies want to have a stable legal framework, but we create that, that framework. And <clears throat> final point, when you look at the European Union, our part of the European Union contributes to the strength of the European Union, to the growing role in the world, because we did develop quick, quicker, much quicker. Average of the three C's initiative is more than 3%, much more than the Western Europe, which have problems with transforming the state. Poland, it's almost 5% yearly. So we are very proud that through development, being part of Europe, we also contribute to the growing role of the European Union in the world, and we would like to that it is assessed properly, that it is due to our work in the region, we make European Union stronger. Minister Piccolo, uh, there's a lot of uh, talk about investing in roads, railroads, um, energy, which is really important from security standpoint of view. But we heard uh, Professor Leskovic at the beginning, and we heard also the general talking about quantum computing, and hopefully we'll talk about 5G later on. Um, what is the next, and you come from the ministry that covers also science. So what do you see from your standpoint that the three Cs can uh, help achieve to promote the next big thing in, in science? What we're doing at the moment, and where we see this when we were discussing infrastructure before, uh, we're building something that is called a first global center on artificial intelligence. This is part of our biggest research institute, uh, Josef Stefan, and the idea is that uh, obviously uh, there is technology, but then there is everything around technology, from ethical issues to policy issues, to all of that that remains and something that Professor Leskovitz has so nicely uh, spelled out. So we're doing this not for ourselves. We're doing this for the greater good, if you want. We're doing this for the humanity. And I see this as part of our efforts in terms of 3SI. Because we will be able, and the idea of the center is that we share experience. 
that people come and go and that we network on these, uh, on these issues. And uh, this can be one of those very concrete uh, logical steps out of what we're talking uh, just now. Because there's always physical infrastructure, but then there is always human and uh, all the rest that you can also call, in a sense, uh, infrastructure. And what we're offering uh, also to, to our partners in 3SI uh, is this. We're also building uh, uh, HPC, uh, that is high performance computer at the moment. So it will be one of those rare high performance computers in Europe that will be there. And again, this is not just for us. Yes, it's for our researchers. But then also it's for the others. It's where we share cap cap capabilities, where we network, where we work together and so on and on and on. It's never just, you know, those large scale projects are never just uh, national, they're, they're, always, uh, they're always international. And I see initiatives such as this, uh, obviously, as one of the ways where we can uh, globalize, internationalize our efforts. General, uh, uh, obviously, artificial intelligence is already changing, is already a game changer. But um, you were talking at the beginning uh, about relationship between US and China and Europe and, and, and Russia. And since we move to the techno technology part and security, 5G is the one that will be transforming our waves of communication and waves of living. And you have pretty um, interesting um, concept of uh, dividing 5G, right? Well, 5G um, to me is the, the, is the technology that's closest to uh, our door in terms of disrupting our our entire societies. Um, and by disrupting, I mean transforming. And I, I mean that really in a positive way, not a negative way. Um, 5G technology will change the way we work, the way we play, the way we think, uh, the way we do things. Um, and I would make a distinction uh, or a statement up front that says for anyone who's talking about the future of smart cities, you will never have a smart city if you don't have secure 5G. Imagine driverless cars that can be, whose uh, control system can be hacked into uh, and by someone who wants to create 300 accidents. Um, that could be done if you don't have secure 5G. 5G is, uh, is essentially, the G stands for generation, but it's a fifth generation wireless technology and it's extremely disruptive. Um, and, and when used in a secure mode, it can really transform the way we live. Uh, it gives you, it would give you an ability, for instance, at the state level, to have complete security and assurance that your state secrets are protected. Uh, in, the, in the corporate world, it would mean that your intellectual properties could not be hacked um, and in the, private, in the private citizen world, it means that your cell phone is also secure and cannot be penetrated. Uh, so this is extraordinarily transformative and, and there is a race going on and you're reading about it in the newspapers about uh, China and, and the US position. And I, I should say, hopefully most of the European positions with regard to uh, China's long-term goals. Now, we talked about Russia earlier because this is the nation that's closest to um, Europe, Eastern Europe in particular, but we should never forget the fact that China, on its current ideological path, is, um, is embarked on um, essentially becoming the dominant country on the planet within the next 20 or 30 years. It'll be, it's that quick and it's that ideological. And one of the ways they're doing this is through the exportation of their Huawei company, which is advertising 5G and selling 5G in a very skillful, marketable way uh, at prices that no um, democracy can compete with simply because it's absolutely subsidized but it also has within it the seeds of um, tremendous um, 
disruption uh, in terms of the access that Chinese technology will allow them to have into our way of life, uh, both at the government level, at the corporate level, and at the private citizen level. This is a country that uh, currently has one million Muslims in concentration camps. Within a year, this is a country that will give grades to its citizens and the quality of life for the citizens who do not get good grades um, will not be enhanced. And this is a country that is embarked on ideological conquest uh, wherever, it can, wherever it can spread its, uh, its ideology, uh, but in a very seductive, very affordable way that unfortunately many people are buying into. The United States uh, intends to uh, answer that challenge um, by, and we are developing a technology that is secure uh, in the 5G or the 4G world uh, that would be made available to our friends and allies so they can control their own uh, security and um, will become absolutely essential when you look at the interoperability of an organization like NATO with 30, soon to be 30 countries in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, you cannot have a Chinese system and a Western system working side by side. So the consequences and the decisions that have to be made on, this, the, on 5G, first of all, understanding how transformative and disruptive it will be, but secondly, the choices that can be made, that have to be made, um, uh, are extraordinarily important for our collective future and our security. What can Slovenia and Poland and all three CIS uh, countries do that uh, basically we will still have the civil rights, rule of law, and all those great achievements that are known for Europe and basically try to bring on also partners from US, from China. Uh, how can we, uh, we were listening that uh, we are undercapitalized here in this part of Europe, but still can we do a leap jump and uh, be innovative because we hear that we have some great projects going on that can be basically something completely new but in um, really in line with uh, the values that Europe has. Can I ask? I think that <coughs> for Poland from our perspective European Union is a main organization we feel as Poles part of Europe uh, traditionally in terms of history and uh, indeed uh, in Poland more than 90, 91% of Poles are uh, expressed in the opinion polls conducted by the European Commission are for European integration so we are very much uh, oriented towards uh, the European Union and want to play a role there after joining it 15 years ago so already, already we perceive ourselves as a mat matured country. But at the same time, there are very important global challenges. It was mentioned by the general China, but also Middle East, Russia. So these challenges ca cannot be met only by the European Union. So in our perspective, we have to look for allies. And these allies are the Western countries, Western democracies like the U.S., first of all, Canada, U, uh, uh, Republic of Korea, Japan, Australia. So these are countries we have to be united in order to meet these challenges. For example, Middle East, there's a lot of problems there. There's difficult situation we know very well, but the European Union with its foreign policy is not, uh, not enough strong and uh, influential uh, in order to change the behavior of actors there. So, it is our point of view. Not everybody, I think, shares that opinion within the European Union because, uh, because maybe some countries think or some people think that the European Union sh should be more autonomous. But again, to face these ch challenges, 5G uh, it was mentioned as an example, we have to uh, be united. Therefore, in our policy, we'll be always for strong tra transatlantic links and also robust NATO alliance. So this is, uh, this is how we see that situation. Okay, very, 
I will just try to add a few things to this. Uh, uh, first of all, I believe that uh, we Europeans must do all we can to remain safe. Uh, this is also a prerequisite, this is also a precondition to provide for enough freedom to be innovative, to be creative. And um, we need both. We need freedom and we need security, safety. But we also need to stay open, especially towards our friends all around the world, of course, the United States and others, to cooperate because uh, no continent and no country alone today can be successful and can provide for safety, security against terrorism, against cyber attacks, and so on and so forth. So definitely, this is a very difficult task. How to combine all these elements to provide free society and development, sustainable development for our future generations. Then, talking about geo politics. I would like to say that uh, when I met with my two colleagues from uh, Germany and Portugal a few weeks ago in Berlin uh, within the trio, the three countries which will coordinate their activities during their term of presidency over the European Union and Slovenia will take over the presidency in 2029, uh, 2021 we especially discussed one of priorities, which is how to make the European Union more significant, more powerful player in the international arena. This is very important because we have a lot of capacities, but so far, so far we have been the greatest donator. We have provided for a large amount of humanitarian aid and uh, development aid and so on and so forth, but we are not enough, I would say, coordinated or powerful to play a more important role in geopolitics, which was briefly mentioned with my two uh, colleagues. So I think that we must uh, work also on this, and Slovenia will definitely um, take this uh, together with other two countries as a very important priority in the next few years. But of course, the Europe, and this is my last uh, thought, must stay united. We must be open, cooperate, collaborate with other countries, with our friends, allies. But as long as we are united, we are strong. And it was already said, united we stand, divided we fall. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Before Aisha takes us uh, through the end, uh, we have uh, time for one quick uh, Q&A. Uh, one quick uh, question from the audience. Do we have any hands raised? All right, first row over there. Thank you so much for the interesting channel, um, um, panel. Uh, I would like just to share that this morning we had as a Chamber of Commerce, I come from the Chamber of Commerce of Slovenia, we had a meeting and we discussed of um, how we as chambers in the three seas um, initiative uh, region can look into what we can do more to, uh, um, to be good for our uh, countries and to each other in the region. Um, but since a lot of historical data was mentioned today, I would just like uh, to leave with a note that uh, today is a historical day, 75th anniversary. This year we will have a 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. But we were not all under the um, curtain, the, the Iron Curtain. The countries of the ex-Yugoslavia were not part of that. And we had the free, the liberty because of that to be friends and to forge partnerships with West and East. So even our history might be similar, it's not the same in the countries of the Three Seas Initiative, and that gives us better strength. And also with a discussion that were also some uh, could be heard in, in the initiative, is it, um, is it good for Europe? Is it bad for Europe? It's definitely good for Europe. In my personal view, I think that uh, the three uh, the CIS initiatives comes as an um, echo of a um, quarter of a century being part of the European Union. 
and realizing how much we have achieved in that time and how much also um, older members of the European Union have profited also from, from our common alliances and joining to the EU. But also we have probably not fulfilled of all of our wishes. We probably thought that in quarter of a century we will be on par with Western Europe, but we are not. So it is important that the countries in this region uh, take a turn and look into ourselves and also into our relationships with um, EU, with other countries around the world, and find a way of how we will be on par with the, uh, in Europe. And in this way, we will make Europe stronger and Europe will be stronger as such. Thank you so much, Sonia, for a closing, uh, for your remarks. Um, Sonia Schmutz, she is the CEO of the Slovenian Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and with that, I would also like to say a kudos to Slovenian Chamber of Commerce and Ministry of Foreign Affairs. A great job you did with this uh, summit and with this business forum. Uh, thank you also to the esteemed panelists. And with that, I'll just ask our Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Deputy Prime Minister of Slovenia, to have his closing remarks. Please, Mr. Serer. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, we have reached the end of the 2019 Three Seas Initiative Business Forum. But before we part ways, I want to use this last opportunity to thank you for coming to Ljubljana, for sharing your thoughts and ideas, for fostering our common commitment to the unity, cohesion, and connectivity in this region, in the wider European region, as well as all the way across the Atlantic. Let me also thank to those that made this possible, the organizers, my team at the Ministry, our Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and the Center for European Perspective, as well as our partners from the private sector, Port of Copper and LS as gold partners, and Google Gain and Comtrade as partners. Now, we often tend to forget that Three Seas Initiative unites, as it was said before, the EU member states only. So if somebody asks, could this initiative go against interests of the EU, the answer should be, how could we, the member states, work against our own European interests? We cannot, or we shall not. On the contrary, by combining our efforts, by filling the gaps between different cycles of development, by avoiding double standards, we are creating stronger, more united Europe. Slovenia is active in three of four EU macro-regional strategies, namely the Alpine, the Nubian, and Ionian Adriatic strategy, and is learning from the experience of the fourth, the Baltic wine one. In such cooperations, you learn what synergies are, what the when the final result is more than simple sum of its parts. Three Cs can go not only beyond borders, but also beyond expectations. Let us surprise the skeptics with concrete, tangible results. Sometimes one concrete project, tangible investments, be it a bridge, a tunnel, or a high-speed internet highway, can tell more to our citizens about our sincere intentions than all declarations combined. Is this a political initiative? Of course it is, if we consider politics, politics in its normative sense as creating policies in order to shape better conditions for everyday life as co-working for common good. When talking about connectivity, we should never forget what connects us the most in the European Union, not roads, rail tracks, or flying corridors. No, what connects us the most are our common values and particularly the rule of law, as I said before. Without this glue, Europe is not what it used to be, nor what it should be. So, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, let us build such European Union further on. And let us connect with the future by trying to understand our young ones. Thank you for your particip participation, and I wish you all the best. Thanks. <laughs>